Welcome to You Can Do It Too, a podcast highlighting regular folks who followed their dreams and made it happen. I'm Joan Hutchinson, your restaurant maven. I've been described as a risk taker, though I never thought of myself that way. My mom always told me I could do or be whatever I wanted as long as I set my mind to it, and I believed her. I ran a successful catering company that led to owning and operating a top 10 Orange County restaurant and catering venue prior to earning a bachelor's degree in business management and marketing. You know what I learned by going to school after all of that? You don't need a degree to accomplish your dreams. You need drive, passion, and a belief in yourself. You also need some caring folks who support you and believe in you. I didn't need a formula to tell me how to properly staff for a week. I needed common sense and a deep care for creating outstanding dining experiences for my guests. I've been coaching and consulting with salespeople and small business owners for the last few years and blogging with business advice. I just wanted to do more, to reach more of you. I decided to talk with folks I admire who kick ass at what they do to show you that you can do it too. All right, welcome, and thanks so much for joining us today. I'm Joan Hutchinson, your restaurant maven, and I am here today with Michelle Steiner. Michelle lives with an invisible disability, dyscalculia. She's also a writer, advocate, and paraeducator. Her articles have been published in The Mighty, Nonverbal Learning Project, Dyscalculia Blog, The Reluctant Spoonie, Calipina Collective, Imagine the World as One Magazine. (laughs) And she's also a photographer. Her photographs are featured in Word Gathering and Independent and Work Ready. She works as a paraeducator in a school with students with disabilities. And Michelle's recently began a blog called Michelle's Mission. Welcome, Michelle Steiner. Oh, thank you so much, Joan, for having me. I certainly appreciate it. Oh my gosh, Michelle, you are such an inspiration. I'm I'm really excited to talk with you today and share your story. You have an invisible disability, and I think I'm saying that right, dyscalculia. Can you explain to us what that is? Sure. Uh, It's dyscalculia or dyscalculia, depending on how you pronounce it. Um, What that is, is that is a math learning disability. And what that, it's just very hard for me to understand mathematical concepts, uh, addition, subtraction, Um, how the numbers work together. I can do very basic math, but beyond that, it can be really difficult. And what a lot of people don't understand is it's not just contained to a math class or a math course that someone might go through and think, oh, I really don't like this and I'm, I'm struggling. This is something that impacts my everyday life. I'm not able to read Uh, the face of an analog clock. I need to have a digital clock. I struggle with some things such as budgeting, uh, how much you might tip whenever you go to the store. I never know whenever I'm out shopping how much I'm going to be spending. And it's always a surprise to me when I get to the register, which I'm sure it is with everybody. But for Mm -hmm. me, it's really like, oh, I didn't realize that. And it also affects other areas that I didn't even know about until I was older. Uh, It can affect directional concepts. If somebody tells me east, south, or west, I'm not sure what you're talking about. I also confuse my right from my left. And those are just some of those uh, things that having that. And I have some other learning disabilities as well. And when you combine all those together, it can create some difficulties. Wow. Um, so first of all, I got to tell you that I have trouble with East, West, North, and South as well. Yeah. So, <laughs> you're not alone there. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. uh, and my daughter can never remember what's left and right. So I, I do this all <laughs> is left. Um, <laughs> but, um, wow. So in, it, it seems like I, I've, I've never heard of this before, and I'm probably not alone. Have, 
In, in one of your blogs, you talked about overcoming the idea that you were stupid and not capable and mm -hmm. uh, you were frustrated by your teachers and your peers and that they weren't helpful. How old were you when you were diagnosed with this? I was diagnosed whenever I was in kindergarten. I right away, my teachers could see that I was really struggling when I was in the classroom, uh, socially and academically. Uh, but basically, it was a lot more academics. I can remember uh, I would struggle with counting and tying my shoes. And I remember dot to dot pages were always really hard, too. I can remember getting a page and thinking, oh, I did that perfectly. And when I got it back, it wasn't correct. And that's part of my visual perception one. So my teacher recommended that I get tested for having a learning disability. And sure enough, they found out I had one. And I think one of the only things they got right <laughs> in that evaluation was I was never going to be a mathematician because <laughs> yeah, we, we knew yeah. that my dad, the, I remember the, my dad telling me that the psychologist said, your daughter is never going to understand what math is. And of course my dad's like, well, what do you mean? <laughs> right. And, okay. and they also had a pretty bleak predictions of what my life was going to be like from the time I was really young. I, a lot of them didn't think that I was going to be successful in, in what I was going to do for my life. Mm -hmm. Which is so terrible to even speak that to a child <laughs> or a parent, because that is, is immediately um, introducing that negative mindset. And it's just, it's not fair and it's not right because, I mean, look at Helen Keller, right? I mean- right. Holy smokes, you cannot tell somebody they can't do something, right? Right. Wow. So can you talk? So I guess that that would cause a lot of that social kind of thing mm -hmm. because at the, in those times, I mean, they probably put you in a separate classroom, right? So right, right. there, they called you out. Yes, I had to repeat kindergarten in a new school, and I went to learning support in the morning, in the very beginning, in kindergarten in the afternoon, and it was also a very small school district in a very small community where they didn't value diversity. It was a public school, but it was a very uh, small school, so I couldn't hide that I went to learning support for math or, or once I was in uh, regular ed classes, I couldn't hide that I was going there to get a test read aloud to me or to have extra time on the test. And that was really hard. And I didn't know any of my peers to struggle with math, even my learning support peers. They struggled with reading. A lot of them had behavior problems because some of them came from some really rough backgrounds and they didn't understand as much about trauma as we do now. Right. And they didn't think I was smart. And my learning, uh, my peers, my, reg my regular ed peers also didn't view me as smart. Right, right. So, so teacher, you know, we always assume that teachers are empathetic and caring people and they, they aren't all, I guess it's just like everything else, right? Exactly. I mean, I had some really great teachers, too. I had ones who did encourage me. They could see the, the potential in me, and they really pushed that. And they, in fact, I got to meet one of them uh, again uh, a couple of years ago. And she was my first teacher, one of my first learning support teachers. And I had that chance to thank her. Mm -hmm. And my mom, I told her later, and she goes, yeah, that was your first learning support teacher. And she was, I think, my favorite out of all of them. She would call my mom up if something was going on in the classroom, or my mom would call her, and they would figure out uh, how to work with me and not, not give up on me. And she was probably really caring. Mm -hmm. And I've also had some teachers who weren't that uh, wonderful <laughs> with understanding the disability. Mm -hmm. I, I can remember being in second grade, and my teacher putting on my report card W, indicating weakness for handwriting. And we knew that I had a learning disability. And I didn't also find out until later I have hand dexterity issues. And just seeing that was really heartbreaking as a young child. Mm -hmm. um, and I also had a teacher that I was coloring a picture of a world map 
And he, I thought I was doing a good job. And he held it up to the room and said, does this look like she's doing your best? <gasps> As a, and my parents oh my were gosh. pretty upset when I told them and they did bring it up in a meeting and that was taken care of at, at the school. But, and those were in the early years. A lot of the, the issues uh, got a little more complicated whenever I got into high school and we were figuring out, well, what do you want to do with the rest of your life? Mm -hmm. And I knew that I wanted to go on to college, but I was hesitant. I knew that going on was going to mean uh, dealing with math classes and we were never successful with getting out of learning support math. And I was doing well in my other classes. I was making honor roll and I had a learning support teacher that said, I don't think you can handle college because of your math. And I think wow. you should go to trade school, which there's nothing wrong with doing that. If that's something that you like to do and it interests you, there's a lot of great programs, but nothing there interested me. Mm -hmm. So I decided that I was going to go to college and I had a student teacher that encouraged me. She said, you know how to study so you can do it. And I also got involved with an agency called Office for Vocational Rehabilitation and they provide free testing. They provide the, uh, the thing that you can get at disability accommodations at your school. The only thing was I, whenever I had to get test, I had to get tested for a learning disability again. Mm -hmm. And I had a psychiatrist who tested me and said, I've never been a great test taker. And he said, based on your scores, you're most likely not going to go beyond a community college. <sighs> and, and hearing that was also really heartbreaking too, because I was already afraid. Right. And I had right. another professor. Yeah. It's scary when you go to, when you're going to college, even for people without disabilities. Yeah. So why do they have to make it harder? Right. Exactly. In instead, let's figure out how we can give you the support you need. You mm -hmm. know, ugh, it's frustrating. Yeah, exactly. I mean, if they could, if they would have known and get to ask me, how can we support you? It would have been a lot better because there was stigma. I still faced out of college. I had peers that thought I was getting an unfair advantage with accommodations mm -hmm. and I didn't use them. And that was a big mistake because my grades dropped. And luckily right. I had a professor that said, Hey, why don't we at least get you extended test time? Ha. And okay. I, so hang yeah. on one second. I got to yes. interrupt you. Because that that's one of my questions. Okay, and I will, before yeah. before we get to that, sure. <laughs> we need to hear a word from our sponsor. So just okay. give us a minute. Hang tight, everybody. Hang tight, Michelle. We're going to listen to a couple of sponsors info and we will be right back. I am lucky to have some amazing award-winning cheeses right up the road. Door Artisan Cheese in Egg Harbor, Wisconsin offers small batch cheeses that have been winning awards for years. And in Wisconsin, that's some tough competition. You don't have to live in Door County to get these cheeses though. Just go to DoorArtisanCheese.com and check out their selection. Their most popular is the Top Hat Cheddar, but my favorite is their beer washed Gouda called Valmi. Check them out for yourself at DoorArtisanCheese.com. If you're an expert in your field, have a unique story to tell, or an interesting point of view, it's time to explore the world of podcasting with KitCaster, a podcast booking agency. You can expect a completely customized concierge service from their staff of communication experts. KitCaster is your secret weapon in podcasting for business. Your audience is waiting to hear from you. Go to kitcaster.com slash maven to apply for a special offer for friends of this podcast. All right. Welcome back. This is You Can Do It Too. I am Joan Hutchinson, your restaurant maven, and I am here with Michelle Steiner. And we are talking about her experiences when she was starting to go to college. So you were telling me uh, that you decided not to use the accommodations that they offered you because of your disability. And that was one of my questions is talking a little bit about the importance of asking for help. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> 
Definitely. That is something that was really important that, uh, that I did ask for help because whenever I didn't, my grades really dropped and everybody was telling me, oh, you need to try harder. And I was like, well, I can, I'm doing what I can, but without having that accom those accommodations, that was really a challenge for me. Yeah. And that has just been the key is knowing what I needed to do. I had a professor that said, well, why don't we at least get you extended test time? She was really helpful. Mm -hmm. But I also had other people still, not even peers, but I had uh, an advisor who told me I'd have limited job choices as well. And just hearing that was really discouraging to me because I thought, well, I can't do this. And But I made it through college. Um, okay. So you, your parents must be amazing people. I mean, <laughs> they are. You you stuck to it. You knew what you wanted. You, right. you made a decision that you were going to do it. Were they super supportive? Were they helping you at home? They, they were definitely supportive, especially with giving me rides to college. That was always something, you know, being supportive. Also being that supportive parent that if you told them about something that might happen at campus, like, okay, yeah, that doesn't sound right. That person, you know, may have not be the, <laughs> uh, the, we don't exactly agree with that, but you still have to go into class. You still have to try to give them what they want. Right. And I think that's what a lot of our kids need is a parent that's going to stand by you and support you, but is also going to let you sometimes uh, develop those resilience, uh, the resilience skills that you really need to have because, you know, it's one of those just very important because life isn't always going to be easy with that but there there just comes a time you have to learn from a lot of those uh, things that you go through and mm -hmm. for sure and I also had that right after college I had the chance to uh, I moved out on my own I found a job working uh, several temp jobs working with students with disabilities and was happy to be on my own because I had independence and I can, I can't drive because of my learning disability. So I was living in a central location with my first apartment and mm -hmm. all the, you know, the learning that you get from that. And it was good, except I always wanted more for myself. I always wanted to go and get my bachelor's degree and do other things with my life. And I was just uh, at a point where I just wanted more. And I guess be careful what you wish for. <laughs> Because financially, I had to move back in with my parents for a while. And my, the job I was at was downsizing. And I found a program at the university uh, nearby that had the least amount of math and science possible and had a degree that you could work with uh, people that had disabilities on the, the service end. And they also had disability accommodations. And I, th I told myself, all I have to do is try. And I can remember when I went there, I, I took advantage, I used the, all the disability accommodations at this time. I had a couple of years of maturity. I uh, had a note taker. I had extended test time. I went to tutoring if I was really struggling in a subject. And most importantly, I advocated for myself. Every time I had a new professor, I would come up and introduce myself at the end of class and just say the, the accommodations that I would need. And most of them were really understanding and kind. Uh, a couple of them, it, they didn't seem to get the memo, but I was able to work through that. Mm -hmm. And there was still the stigma. There were still people that were saying that, oh, those are cheating. I wish I had a disability. But I learned to just kind of shut those voices off and just focus on what I needed to do. And this time, at that time around with college was so much better. Mm -hmm. I was able to, uh, my grades improved a lot because I was using the accommodations and I made Dean's List for a semester. Wow. And I was able to graduate with a bachelor's degree in community program for Americans with disabilities, despite being told I couldn't do it. Yes. That's, that's yeah. awesome. You just want to you just want to walk up to those people that told you you wouldn't be able to do it with the paper and go, "See, you were wrong." Yeah, and I did have a similar experience. I can remember I was thinking about grad school, which didn't work out, but I went in to uh get the if I needed to have 
the testing, I had to have extended test time. And they made me get tested for having a learning disability again. Oh, and I went in and there was another time I went in with that too. And their results are may, are always like, I put down, I have a bachelor's degree. And then when they ask you, oh, what do you want to do with your life? If you could do any kind of job. And I put like, oh, I'd like to do news reports or I like to do writing. And they'll put right on my report. Well, we're not even going to consider that because that's beyond your, ex that's beyond oh, your capacity. God. And oh, I just find that amazing that, I, yeah, every time I would go in there, they really did. They really underestimated what I could do. I mean, I guess I understand the mm -hmm. point of trying to get you to be realistic, but mm -hmm. so you just kept proving people wrong one yep. after another, exceeding expectations that other people set for you or imagined that you were capable of what gave you the will to keep pushing? I think what gave me the will to keep pushing was I wanted to help other people that had disabilities. That was the main thing in my life. I always had this. I wanted to go out there and to make a difference and to be able to show other people that it may be difficult. Uh, there might be some challenges in the way, but they can do it. And I also, I had a great support system with my parents and I had a wonderful support system with friends. They, none of them could fix my disability or, you know, make it all better or go away, but they could be my, my family and they could also be my friends. And sometimes just having that and knowing somebody was in your corner, no matter what, was a, a lot of support with that too. And some of them had resources. And I think that's an important thing too, because, uh, a lot of times I'll share resources with other people and other people will share resources with me. And uh, that helps everybody to be able to see what is out there. Mm -hmm. So, so important. I talk about that in my intro. Mm -hmm. So, so important to have people around you that are supportive because when you're having a hard time, sometimes you need that. Mm -hmm. you can do it. Look how great you're doing, right? Every once in a while, things do get to you. You can't, you can't be impenetrable, right? Right. Hey, man, you also say that the disability I, in one of your blogs, you said the disability wasn't the problem. It was how you thought about the disability or your mindset. Uh, I love to talk about that. So can you elaborate on that? I think with having a disability, it's not always that big of an issue for me because I've learned, I learn ways to cope and to compensate for having one. But I think sometimes it's how other people perceive it. Sometimes I'll run into people that'll say, oh, you don't look like you're disabled. <laughs> and I have to tell them, well, not every disability is visible. Or other people might have issues with me not knowing how to do math or me not knowing how to drive. And that becomes their issues that they're projecting on me. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people, as I said, I, I learned to cope and to compensate. So I know what I need to do. And uh, recently I was in the grocery store and sometimes if I'm, if it's really busy, my husband will come in with me and he'll help me uh, just to be able to navigate the store a little bit easier, mm -hmm. which I can do on my own, but it just makes it easier if there's a lot of people and trying to push the cart and trying to right. unload things. But I was just, the, the, it was not a busy day and he was in the car and I had a nice time shopping and I was unloading my cart and this woman came up behind me in my lane and she started unloading my cart for me. And I was a little like, okay, a little surprised. And I said, oh, well, thank you so much for, for helping me. She goes, oh yeah, I like to help people and you look like you really needed it. Oh, <laughs> and so, and I, I didn't know what to say. So I just smiled and said, oh, well, God bless you. And I, I just sometimes think I'm so used to what I need to do in developing my own system that mm -hmm. I don't think it looks weird or unusual, but other people sometimes do. And, and sometimes mm -hmm. they're the ones that might have that issue. And I, I'm certainly not against somebody helping. I think it's just the, the approach that you take. I like, I like how you said that, though. I like how you said... Other people perceive it and it's their issue. It, it isn't your issue. You've lived right. with this. You know how to deal with it. You don't have a problem with it. Mm -hmm. There is no problem. The only problem right. is in their head, right? 
Right. There's no reason, no reason to feel sorry for me. I know what I'm doing. I know what's going on. I know how to get through life. I'm good. Yeah, exactly. Because people are adaptable. You have to learn how to adapt to your situation and, and how to change. And my parents have always pushed independence with me. And that, yeah, this is just how we do things. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. And you are, you're so positive and you're, and you're, you're just kind of a can do kind of girl, it seems. I mean, <laughs> you just seem like, well, you know, I'm just going to figure it out and make, make shit happen. Right. I mean, right. um, you just have such a great attitude that a lot of people don't have and that they need. Right. I mean, I, I, I feel like in our lives, there's always hurdles we're going to have to get over. Mm -hmm. There's always something that's going to happen in your life that isn't what you expected and something isn't how you planned. And you're going to mm -hmm. have to figure out how to make it happen and how to get yourself through it. And there mm -hmm. isn't any point in, in just dwelling on the negative, right? It's about figuring out how to get what you need and make things happen. It's so important. Like when I asked you about the importance of asking for help, you know, in the restaurant industry, that's mm -hmm. a, a really big thing because mm -hmm. there's so many people involved in creating a meal for, for a dining guest. Mm -hmm. And, um, and there's all ki there's all kinds of things that have to happen, you know. Those people when they get seated, first of all, they have to get greeted and seated, and then the server mm -hmm. has to acknowledge their presence, and then they have to take their order, and then they have to deliver the food. But not just that, then the cooks have to cook. So there's so many people involved. And um, I have worked with servers. I mean, my background obviously is restaurants, and mm -hmm. I've worked with servers that didn't want to ask for help. So they would be busy. They would be too busy. There's no right. way a normal person could handle that, right? Mm -hmm. But they don't want you to think that they don't know what they're doing or that they can't handle it. So they don't ask for help. And you know what it does? It creates a bad dining experience. All you have right. to do when you, like you said, I had to know what I needed. Mm -hmm. so I could ask for it. And that's that. I mean, that's what I tell the servers, you know, a great server knows how to ask for help. A great server understands that it's not about how good you look. It's about creating a great dining experience for that guest. It's, it's not about how bad do I look when I ask for mm -hmm. help. It's about getting what I need to make shit happen. Right? Right. Exactly. It's really knowing what you need to, um, and just being able to ask for that and be able to identify that. I've had a lot of people with jobs that have told me you're really good at saying what you need. Yeah. And it's, it's just knowing that I also, I'm not with my visual perception. I can't use an escalator. So my friends have known this for years and we'll be out in public and sometimes they'll be getting on the escalator. I'm like, oh, I'm so sorry. I forgot. You need an elevator. I'm like, OK, I'll just go get an elevator, and meet you at the top. And I had a friend that said, I'm really impressed. She goes, you you just go and you just do what you need to do. I'm mm -hmm. like, well, that's what we do. I mean, it's so much more positive for me to focus in on what I can do rather than what I can't do. Because if I sit around and focus ev on everything that I can't, it, it really brings me down. But if I think, okay, this is what I can do, or this is what we're going to do when we come into that situation, it, it helps me a lot better. Oh my gosh, that is so profound what you just said right there. I want to focus on what I can do instead of what I can't do, Yeah. right? Is that, I mean... Did you just come up with that? Or did your parents help you with that? That's just something that I, well, I've always had my parents telling me to focus on what I could do. And I think I was in a bad place with being negative. And I thought, oh, what's the point? All I could see is what I couldn't do. And then when I finally started focusing on things I was good at, writing, 
Um, I also found whenever I was in a class, as long as it didn't, didn't involve math or <laughs> uh-huh. um, science, I could get an A in the class or I could. And if I studied how I knew I could do that, I would do really well. And I think that's the key thing is just I started this where I'm like, okay, I'm going to focus on what I can do. And we're just not going to worry about what I can't. And we'll compensate the the best way that we can do that. And that took a long time. That was a real journey for me because I wasn't always positive. I wasn't always happy about having the disability. And a lot of that changed when I got the, the bachelor's degree. And I know it's different for everybody. Maybe not everybody wants to go out and do that, or they might have barriers to that. And I don't think it's necessarily the key to happiness, but for me, that's what I needed to do to begin to think more positively about myself. Right. It gave you the confidence. You said, yeah. I can do it. That's Yeah. And I think if I didn't have that, I would not be able to have so much hope when I work with students who have disabilities or when I write on my blog or take a picture and share that. I don't think I would have that confidence, Mm -hmm. but I found the things that I can do and that that I am good at. If you'd asked me to (laughs) compete in a math game or give me, uh, ask for uh, (laughs) uh, advice on stocks or things like that, I I couldn't tell you that. And if I focused my, my energy on that, I probably would be really um, not not happy, but right. when I focus on what I can, then it, it I, I feel a lot more confident and happy. Hmm. Oh, well, what's funny is I, w- I was going to say, can you share a tool that you use to stay positive and keep moving forward? And it sounds to me like that's the tool. It is. And I think writing has been that tool too for me because that gives me the voice. Because sometimes if I can't say something out loud about somebody or I don't want to, I can write whatever I want and I can put that in the word of a character or I can just write about my feelings. Uh, I may not publish that, but I can write about that. And that gives me that voice that I can say something. Mm -hmm. And I think that's important. Or I can take uh, pictures of things. And that's another way that it, it makes me happy. I'm I'm able to uh, get in my own little world whenever I do that and get to see uh, things that other people would miss whenever, uh, if I was driving, I would miss that opportunity. I wouldn't get the chance to walk to that place and take that picture. Or I wouldn't be uh, able to take that photo because I'd be concentrating on the road. But I, I have that opportunity because of my, the circumstances. I love that. I love how you did, did just did that. You took things where we go, I can't drive. And you said, since I don't drive, I get mm-hmm. to stop and smell the roses. <laughs> right? I mean, since you don't, yeah. <laughs> you took right. that, what, what other people see as a negative, and it's not. It's a mindset. It's your, it's, it's your little gift. Mm-hmm. Exactly. It's just how you view it. Um, how how you view things. Absolutely. Oh my gosh. So what got you into photography, Michelle? Well, one of the first things that led me there was everybody told me that, oh, you have a learning disability. You must be a wonderful artist. And I remember <laughs> with my hand dexterity, I couldn't draw a straight line. Mm-hmm. I couldn't color <laughs> in the lines. And I was really frustrated every time I went to an art class. But I remember I was taking pictures of prom and I took a picture of this tree that I saw that was a prom. And all my peers were like, why'd you take a picture of a tree? (laughs) And I was at a writing group and I showed it to an older woman that ran the group. And she said, this shows perspective. And she could see all this potential in me. And I I put that on the shelf for a lot of years. I, I didn't do a lot with it. I had a friend that argued with me insistently that you know incessantly that I could do art and I told him oh no I can't do that (laughs) and I was (laughs) taking pictures at a family wedding and we were at a cemetery my husband and I were visiting after the wedding was done and there was these cemetery angels and I took a picture of this and one of my uh, friends saw that she goes wow this is amazing and she was really in like 
she was hard to please. I mean, she, she could, uh, if he, she said something was good, you must have done something right. And I remember putting that into an art show and winning a little prize for it. And nice. yeah, I mean, it was just something small and that encouraged me to take more pictures and to enter more shows. And then I started taking more pictures of flowers and everybody was telling me, wow, you could bring out the details in flowers other people miss. And I started to uh, be able to put them on my blog and I realized that part of that was the gift of not driving, was being able to capture those moments. And also part of it is the, the disability itself with just being able to take in those details and be able to pick up on a lot of that. So that is how I got into photography. Nice. And it's, and it's doing so well. You're winning, winning contests and that's awesome. That is awesome. So, Michelle, do you have a message that you would like to share today? <laughs> yes, I would love to. Okay. I would just love to encourage people with and without disabilities to know what they want to do in life and to be able to find a way to do that. And that success comes in, often comes, doesn't come in the package that you wanted to, but oftentimes it comes in something so much better. Hmm. That's amazing. I love that message. Thank you so much for sharing it. Um, we will definitely share uh, the link to Michelle's website and blog for those of you that are listening and interested in learning more about Michelle and her photographs. And um, Wow. Thanks so much for your message, Michelle. It's such a pleasure talking to you today. Oh, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure talking with you too, Joan. Yeah. So thank you to everyone listening today. Thank you to Chris Hutchinson for editing this and all of my podcasts. And make sure that you like and follow uh, on social media as well as uh, whatever podcast platform you're listening on. Uh, again, I'm Joan Hutchinson, your restaurant maven. If you're looking for help with your restaurant, check out www.yourrestaurantmaven.com. Thank you. We uh, have new podcasts every other Sunday, so make sure you're listening up. See you next time.